Beloved by kids and parents alike, cartoonist Mo Willems welcomed Roadshow to his studio in picturesque Northampton, Massachusetts, where he has created a number of popular children's characters over the past two decades, including Elephant and Piggy, Wilbur the Naked Mole Rat, and a certain pigeon who should not be allowed to drive the bus. Mo talked about what inspires him to make books for kids, his methods as an artist, and his earliest comic influences. I've always wanted to draw and be funny. And for me as a kid, it was the, the funnies in the paper. And particularly Charlie Brown, uh, the peanut strip meant a lot to me. So I, as a young kid, wanted to be a syndicated cartoonist. As a matter of fact, when I was five, I sent a letter to Charles Schultz that said, Dear Mr. Schultz, may I have your job when you're dead? And then I just, I waited. Ultimately, I had to find uh, another path, and my path went from becoming a writer for Sesame Street and also an animator for Sesame Street, and then over the last 17 years or so, a majority of my creative life has been making books. When you're writing for children, you are dealing with the fundamental things, philosophical things. What is love? What is jealousy? Why is friendship so difficult? Can I drive a bus? You know, sort of core fundamental Greek values. I made a formal decision when I started making books that every lead character could be reasonably drawn by a five-year-old. I always want to be on the side of the kids and give them the power. My first designs of the pigeon looked more like a pigeon, but then I needed to reduce it to really basic forms so that somebody can walk by a bookshop and go, I could do that in five minutes. That's the victory. I think of myself as a cartoonist, but I have been very lucky over the last couple years to be able to do weird stuff. Yeah. Oh! Pigeon! Hi, Mom! What are you doing here? Don't you know the title of the show is Don't Let the Pigeon Do Story Time. Don't Let the Pigeon Do Story Time is a comedy concert film at the Kennedy Center in DC where famous comedians read my books as sketch, where we sing songs and we make drawings. I'm trying to teach the grown-ups. If you see Anthony Anderson or Tony Hale or Yvette Nicole Brown or Rachel Dratch jumping up and down and being ridiculous, it allows you to do that at bedtime as well. These are the originals from every book that I have made. Many of Moe's curious creatures live in his colorful studio and were born on a special tool of the trade. This is where I nap and hopefully wake up and get great ideas. Also at home with Moe, a collection of personal treasures he's eager to share with collectibles expert Phil Weiss, a passionate peanuts connoisseur himself who is waiting to meet Mo down on the patio. Hey, how are you, Phil? Good, Mo. How are you? I'm well. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me over. Thanks for coming over. I'm really excited about this. Mo, the three books in front of you, most cartoonists have libraries of books that relate to other cartoonists right. and incorporate cartooning because that's what you do. I was in college. I started buying these cartoon anthologies, and that's where I discovered all of these cartoonists. Everything exploded. For me, the, the way things were drawn, the types of jokes that were being made, everything is so strong and determined. I wanted to be able to draw like that. This is research. Everything that is in my collection is an inspiration, and I go back to the well from time to time. This is a very particular type of geek. We'll have a collection of these. It's a good geek to be. <laughs> in terms of value on the books, with the advent of the internet and the way the prices have come down, I'm sure you can find books like this in the five, ten, fifteen dollar right. range fairly easily. And I see you have a an Altoids tin. Yes, this is Sparky's nib. Years after Charles Schultz, who was known as Sparky, it passed. I became friends with Jeannie, his widow and I visited the Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa, and I got sort of a pretty cool backstage tour where I got to see a lot of his strips and a lot of his unfinished strips. And then they gave me one of his nibs. Now, the nib is the tiny little piece of metal that you put onto uh, basically a pencil holder and you dip in to draw. And I brought it home, and I dipped it in the ink, and 
I started to make a drawing and the ink just splattered. I felt like I was the pen pal in Charlie Brown. Like this pen was so difficult to figure out. So I struggled and I struggled until I finally felt that I had a handle on it. And I illustrated one of my books, Naked Mole Rat Gets Dressed, with Sparky's Nip. Little piece of metal, probably doesn't mean anything to anybody else. But it's a culmination of almost all of my childhood professional dreams. The nib from the pen is fantastic. I would see that go probably to a Peanuts collector, $500 to $1,000, maybe to add it to one of their strips, right. maybe frame it up and put it together. And the key to that is the provenance that it came right from Jeannie Schultz. Every time I dipped this pen in the ink, I was thinking about Sparky and my journey. We'll hear more from Mo. Back in Northampton, let's see what else Mo Willems has to share. I am going to be sharing really the jewel in the crown of my collection, which is a Sunday's peanut strip. And it has everything. One of the things about Charles Schultz was that for him, the shape of letters and the words and how they are formed was a type of cartooning. So this Sunday strip has got Lucy going blah and arg and nya, 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 and all different typefaces and it's just fantastic. And as a piece of original paper, it has wide out. It, you see the pencil marks, you see Sparky struggling through making this gag work. And it's early enough in his career that I think probably every day was a struggle. Peanuts is the most important thing in my creative life. These characters are easy to draw. Charlie Brown is a circle with a letter C for a nose and two dots for eyes. So I could take these characters and do something with them on my own. To own a piece of Sparky's work, to own a piece where he's really starting out and struggling and figuring it out, uh, just, it's magic. I got this with my wife on our paper anniversary. So that was 22 years ago. It was our first big purchase. It's a 1953 Sunday Peanuts. It's actually 1954. Oh, 54. It's 54. See? Oh, yeah. there we go. It's I a year later. I made it's it right. See, I'm trying later. to make it better. Make it a little right. earlier. Yeah, yeah. But still, in the first four years of the strip. Right. Schultz's artwork progressed over the years. And for example, you look at the early Snoopy, you wouldn't recognize him as a Snoopy they had in right. the 70s exactly. or 60s. This happens to be great, especially when you get Lucy involved. Lucy, Linus, Charlie Brown, and Snoopy are the real key characters that right. always get people's interest peaked. The piece spoke to me, and certainly it's a lot like the, the pigeon in Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. She's having a temper tantrum. Temper tantrum. I think what I loved about Peanuts growing up was I would try to draw them. Yes. I didn't get very far. No, <laughs> nowhere near like you. Charlie Brown's head never came out round. Right. But it seemed to be the kind of thing that kids were able to do. Values on the Sunday pages have gone up dramatically over the years. Do you remember what you paid for the strip when you bought it? I, not, not that it's going to be the most important well, factor. Well, no, and it isn't. I will tell you, I spent a couple thousand dollars on this. Then I actually, I don't want to know. I'm going to cl close my ears if you tell them what you think this is worth. I don't want to know. For okay. me, it's eternal. And uh, when I am done with it, it'll go to the Schultz Museum and be with the other cartoons. When it comes to the Schultz Museum, I think it's important because they're trying to get as many as they can into their one facility yeah. and I think they'll be viewed there and not mm -hmm. locked up in storage somewhere where people can't see them. And if you want to plug all right, your ears all right, in there, plug my ear. Don't want to know. If this was an auction today, I estimated somewhere between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars. So you can unplug now. All right. And I'll continue just by saying yeah. that that's a conservative estimate and some of these have sold, I'm not saying this one, mm -hmm. but there have been Sunday pages topping the hundred thousand dollar mark. Right. I would certainly try to make sure it's included on insurance yes, policy. Right, right. Use the $100,000 okay. mark as an insurance value. I'll do that. It's a pleasure seeing this. It's fresh to the market. Hasn't mm -hmm. been seen in how many years? Uh, 22 years. 22, 22 years. years. And again, so. thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Great, really it was a real meeting. joy. Why are my characters animals? When I started to make books, I wanted to be as universal as possible. I chose a pigeon because Nobody else did, right? It's a rat with wings. It's a terrible idea to have a pigeon. It should be a lovely bear or a bunny and be huggable. But 
That means that I own that territory. I get to decide what those characters are. That's why I do a naked mole rat. That's why I pair up an elephant and a pig, because nobody's going to put those animals together. So this hallway has... Oh, oh, you're wearing a mask. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Safety first. Right. You can often find me here, busy at work, oh, like that, having great ideas.